Everybody, I am John Andrasik from the band Five for Fighting. Welcome to Meet the Heroes. As some of you know, I've been very passionate about the withdrawal from Afghanistan, yet I've had the honor to meet incredible people who are keeping the American promise by organizing, executing, and rescuing many that we have left behind. I thought it important that you meet them, that you see their faces, that you know their stories. They are, after all, the shining light of this catastrophe. Our first guest is the perfect guest, the first Green Beret ever elected to Congress. From Florida, Congressman Mike Waltz. He's a dad, he's a veteran, he's the best-selling author of the book Warrior Diplomat. He also has a unique view into Afghanistan, considering his service and his place in Congress. A few weeks ago, I caught up with Mike at the Reagan Library during the Defense Summit. And we sat down and we had a chat. So please sit back and meet a hero, Mike Waltz. So here we are uh, with uh, Congr Congressman Mike Waltz, the first Green Beret ever elected to Congress. So um, meet the heroes goes to another level here. And uh, we have a pretty unique setting here, right? Yeah, it's not bad. Yeah. yeah. So before we even start chatting, I mean, here we are with the Gold Star Memorial here at the Reagan Library um, for the Defense Summit. Mm. Um, President Reagan is laid to rest right here. So what, is, what are your feelings being here? Well, you know, the first three bills that I put through Congress were to, were to help Gold Star families. Mm. I think we've done a pretty good job. Still a long way to go, but a much better job of taking care of our wounded warriors. But too many of our Gold Star families, as soon as TAPS ends at that funeral, mm. they're kind of forgotten. Mm. I mean, things, you know, uh, important things, but things that would kind of blow your mind, like their benefits were being taxed at the highest tax bracket. Huh. Or the, the Defense Department would only pay for the remains to go to one place, but then bill the family if it wanted to go to a national cemetery, that kind of stuff. And th those kind of things are why I ran for office, and we've yeah. gotten them fixed. Yeah. Um, so the families uh, will always be near and dear to my heart, because when we're downrange, Green Beret, SEAL, what have you, we're, we're doing what we train for, and we're doing what we believe in. But the families back home get three bad options. We don't come back, we come back missing limbs, or we come back forever changed. Mm -hmm. But you know, overall, to be here um, at the Reagan Library in such a precarious time in our yeah. nation, in the yeah. wake of the debacle uh, and, and you know, the walking away from our allies that was <laughs> Afghanistan, uh, with Russia on the march, Iran on the march, China on the march, I don't th it's a great reminder Hmm. that dictators uh, will always take advantage of weakness and they're always deterred by strength. Uh, and we need that kind of moral clarity that Ronald Reagan showed right now. Yeah, it's certainly a different tone. You know, just yep. being here th this week and of course the evil empires and, and that whole um, uncertainty we face right now. Um, you could almost feel it in the room, you know, here. So we're going to talk about depressing stuff and inspiring <laughs> stuff. But yeah. let's let's talk a little bit more about you. So um, you're about to have your second child. Yes. Yes, yes. a son, a yeah. boy. Yes. So I have a, an 18, almost 18 year old uh, uh, young lady that's yes. about to head off to college. And yeah. I think, you know, most people deal with empty nest syndrome by getting a dog or traveling. And right here, dude. We decided to <laughs> refill the nest <laughs> yeah. uh, to our, a little bit to our surprise, but, yeah. uh, but it's a blessing. Kids will keep you young. Yeah. Um, uh, so we're excited about it. And your wife, you met through the service and she had quite a, as I say, heroic job within the service. I can't yeah. imagine some of the things she had to go through. Can you talk a little about how you met? And yeah, what so she, she was an intelligence, a military intelligence officer. She yeah. was in uh, the liberation of both Afghanistan and Iraq. Wow. Um, I love introducing her, uh, you know, as having more combat tours than I do <laughs> and a broad star. <laughs> right. Because she's beautiful and just it's not what you would expect. Right. Um, uh, you know, when you first meet her, but then, you know, later was uh, stood up an energy bureau in the State Department, wow. was the State Department's hostage. Wow. negotiator 
and eventually Homeland Security Advisor. So, wow. um, so she's a badass. Yeah. And uh, and, I, and you know I do what she says. Yeah. But uh, but you know amazingly has an amazing story that her mother came here on Ellis Island from mm. Jordan. Wow. Uh, and was a single mom as a night nurse and has has just raised um, uh, you know amazing family. Uh, they never became victims. They always saw the opportunity that this great country provides. Uh, not always evenly, but they yeah. they powered through whatever was thrown in their way and you know truly lived the American dream. It's, uh, you know, we don't talk about that enough. We yeah. see it every day. I see it in our family business, you know, folks that come in and can't speak the language, start at minimum wage, and now their kids are coming back from Princeton and Stanford and Incredible. living a middle, middle class life. They're still... I mean, my own, you know, my, you know, my own mother you know, had a high school education, again, single mom, had three jobs, night yeah. security guard, yeah. clerk. Uh, uh, and, you know, one generation later, I graduated from VMI, Virginia Military Institute, in four years. It took her 15 years of yeah. nights and weekend, right. and we graduated the same year. Oh, right? oh my God, really? <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. But, um, wow, that must have been again, quite a it's, picture. <laughs> it's never in a million yeah. years, you yeah. know, when we were selling whatever we owned at a flea market to buy grocery, you know, to have grocery money, did I think then I'd be a United States congressman. Only in this country, yeah. but as Reagan said, you know, we're just one generation away from losing freedom as we know it if we don't fight for it. And uh, that's one of the reasons I ran for office. I mean, it's, it's incredibly honorable, but let's talk a little bit about your mom and your childhood. Did you always kind of have this um, passion for the military? Did you kind of know as a child what you wanted to do, be a warrior, all that kind of stuff? You know, I grew up in a military town in Jacksonville, uh -huh. Florida. It was a Navy town. Okay. And uh, my father, grandfather, I never really knew them, but they were all Navy. I don't know. I just always had this sense to serve. I obviously defected and went army uh, right. despite having a Navy family. <laughs> right. But um, I think just, uh, especially when I started traveling abroad, you know, and I think that's really missing from a lot of the current generation. Um, go abroad for a while, go to places like I've been in Africa and the Middle East. And when you come back here, you'll kiss the ground when you oh, land. Yes. Yeah. Uh, it, again, not a perfect nation, but yeah. I think the most exceptional in the world and certainly something worth defending. You know, we were talking last night about my little trip to Gitmo. And uh, when you physically see a gate and a guard tower and on that side, you're not free and on this side you are. That's right. It, it really strikes you. And I think, it's, I think it would be great for everybody to, you know, see the rest of the world. And maybe they'd have a different opinion on, on what we have. Well, you know, I mean, you were just talking about Cuba. As a representative from Florida, the Cuban-American community is near and dear. Yeah. And it's, it's incredible, right, that socialism has never worked, does not work, yeah. and will never work. Yeah. And it's, it's sad that the Cubans have been successful all over the world, except in Cuba. Of course. <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, because communism and socialism inevitably have to lead to authoritarianism. Whenever you're taking from one group of people, no matter how hard they work, yeah. and giving to another group of people, no matter how little they work, yeah. it's it's the authoritarian bureaucrats in between making those winner and loser decisions that, that are the, you know, uh, at the end of the day, the real winners. And to, to name drop uh, the rock star Cuban, Rudy Sarzo, <laughs> Ozzy Osbourne, my man, Quiet Riot, White Snake. Uh, and he, he understands, you know, a lot of folks in the arts um, don't really share our wor world view. Yeah. But he understands because he's seen uh, the other side. Yep. Um, so, of course, you know, we're here because of Af Afghanistan, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and we're talking because uh, I'm, I'm trying to introduce the country to, to the folks that are doing the evacs. Most okay. of them, nobody knows their faces. You're in a little different position, mm. but you're still an Afghan vet. You know, yeah. you, you, I'm sure you still have um, contacts, friends, relationships with people there. So... I know it's hard, but when, when the withdrawal went down um, and we saw the aftermath, how did you handle that? What was your personal reaction? You know, it's, it's, um, it's been some of the hardest months emotionally for me. Uh, and I know so many other veterans that I've, I've ever gone through. Yeah. And actually being in the position in Congress in some ways made it worse because mm. so many of my community were looking to me. Yeah. Um, I think as somebody that was in a position to influence things, but not necessarily, you know, kick in the door of the White House and make him change his mind. Right. Uh, because that's ultimately where this decision came from. So to see 
uh, so many of uh, our brothers and sisters that stood with us. You know, we're willing to die for the American flag and the values it represents. We're willing to stand with us and take a bullet to die uh, for their kids' future and the fight against extremism to see them abandoned yeah. and betrayed yeah. uh, in the way they were is was just fundamentally and in every which way un-American. And I think that's why you've seen such a, a vitriolic reaction, regardless of your politics, yeah. because it just cut against everybody's grain uh, to to betray our allies that way and to let terrorists dictate the terms. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Right. Um, so we could sit aside the debate of of whether you know we should have left a residual force or pull everybody out. The way in which we did it uh, was was just painful to my soul. And um, you know the fact is, it's not over. Yeah. It's still ongoing. Right. Uh, I'm getting emails just today saying, I got my one brother, before he came out here. My brother, <laughs> yeah. I, yeah. I fear yeah. you've forgotten about me um, because I've been, and, and I think what has hurt so many veterans and has them so not just grief stricken, but, but angry, uh, one was just the callousness from our own government, just the kind of heartlessness yeah. uh, to the, the plight of those that, you know, when you're in the foxhole together and black, white, brown, you know, yeah, right. uh, yeah. rich or poor, Democrat, Republican, nobody cares. Right. And even uh, with our allies, you're willing to fight and die together. But you know, the other piece too that I think has been so gut-wrenching for so many is just the lack of accountability. Yeah. Uh, you know, it, so many veterans out there, you know, we've, we've court-martialed or seen people relieved right. Or, right. or fired or run out of the military for offenses far less right. than what we just went through. Uh, and uh, that kind of just shoulder shrug um, from the people in charge right now has also been uh, infuriating. Yeah, I, you know, I've had this conversation with many folks and, and from someone from the outside, I really feel that they cannot have closure without accountability. Yeah. Um, not that that will solve anything. Uh, it won't save those that have been murdered by the Taliban. It's not going to take away the PTSD, but until there's some accountability, I think that gut-wrenching yeah. shame yeah. won't end. Well, I do want to say, and I want uh, you know, I want everybody to hear me loud and clear. Mm. Uh, their service was not in vain. Right. This was not your fault. Right. Um, we had, we've had you know, my daughter included. An entire generation of Americans grow right. up now without worrying about planes flying into buildings right. or suicide bombers going off in shopping malls right. uh, because we fought them over there. Right. Um, did we make a lot of mistakes? Hell yeah. I wrote a whole book on it. Yeah. It's called Warrior Diplomat if you yeah. want to read it. Um, and, um, but at the end of the day, uh, uh, if you are going into that dark place, reach out and get help. Uh, there, there are people that are ready to listen and ready to talk you through it, but don't add insult to injury yeah. um, uh, of what just happened. So what do we do going forward? Uh, and one, we're still getting people out. Yeah. I'm not going to let it go. Yeah. Uh, and number two, from an accountability standpoint, as long as I'm in this seat, yeah. I'm not going to let it go. Yeah. And I don't care if it's next month or next year or five years from now, we'll get answers of why these decisions made, who made them, yeah. uh, and, and hold people accountable for them. But then number three, uh, I'm convinced, sadly, and I think tragically, future soldiers are going to have to go back and clean up yeah. this mess. Uh, and it's going to cost us far more in blood and treasure uh, to do so. And I'm doing whatever I can to make sure uh, that we have the tools, whether it's bases or local allies that we keep uh, alive and that we support or what have you to, to, to minimize that when it has to happen. Well, I think it's, it's, uh, we're very fortunate that we have someone with your background and your experience and your patriotism in a place where you can push policy, yeah. um, it, which is what we need. And, to talk about something a little more um, inspirational. And I, I really do think it's the shining light of this, you know, out of 9-11, we saw the country come together in a way we never had before. Mm. Um, there are silver linings in the worst of situations. And to me, the one with Afghanistan are the private Americans who between going to 
work taking their kids to soccer practice or on these Zoom calls, yeah. organizing sophisticated operations, yeah. negotiating with uh, foreign governments, foreign governments themselves, and visas, and, um, yeah. rescuing not only American citizens, not only SIV holders, certainly our, uh, Afghan allies, but you know, lesbian and gay people, female judges. And that's the purpose of this thing. I don't know what we're doing is to, to celebrate them and show the American people uh, really who we are. And that is these evac folks. And ironically, the way kind of I got to know you yeah. um, was for some reason, I was, I believe I was in Buffalo and I was working with a friend, an amazing friend doing the evacs. And she sent me a picture of two uh, American citizens on the Tajikistan border. Mm. They were in their late 80s. They'd yeah. been there 24 hours. They were in really bad health. They literally could see, you know, the other side. I know exactly the case you're talking about. Right. I called the Tajik embassy about yes, it. Yes, well. called the State Department Right, about and we have, yeah. a, we have a, 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 a dear friend, Hugh Hewitt, whose yep. son James worked for you. Yep. And my friend said, I've been working, she, she was in tears, I've been working for two days. These people are gonna die if we don't get them across. And so I reached out to James, reached out to you, and, and the good news is, and this one, we got him out. Yep. But so, from the layman, like, how does that work? Because I know everyday people are calling you, calling your office, I got this American, you know, citizen, I got this Afghan. So when someone calls like me and says, I got these people here, what's the process? How does, what does your team do? What are, what are they really look? do they need papers? Do yeah. they need, so how does that go down? You know, it really, it, I mean, I hate to answer this way, but it depends. Yeah, sure. Um, you know, obviously the U.S. government pulled out, I mean, the Biden administration pulled out all of our military assets, all of our planes, right. all of our helicopters or any ability to go get people. Um, and, um, and then, you know, the State Department no longer has an embassy, so they don't have people on the ground. Right. So really, and I'm so glad that you're highlighting them, it's come down to just this grassroots effort of veterans organizations who are, you know, really remotely managing people on the ground. Uh, they're managing safe houses. They're sending money. They're sending food. Uh, they're, um, you know, just really trying to kind of provide an organizational effort. At the same time, they're working with donors to, um, to, to provide the funds for chartered flights uh, to, to get in there and then organizing all of their papers so that they can present these very organized manifests, in some cases to the Taliban, yeah. in some cases to the, uh, to the US government, or if we're getting them across the border. And for me, where I've found is, is just using the kind of the weight of the office. Okay. Um, where, you know, when a, when a congressman calls the undersecretary of you name it. Right. And if you're prepared to do it, you do it respectfully, but like, yeah. look, we're gonna do this the easy way or the hard way. Right. Uh, and and shake the tree and shake things loose in the bureaucracy and that's um, where you know I at one point we turn several members of my team rather than dealing with legislation or casework in our district uh, for social security cases or whatever you know they were 24 7 helping these groups help uh, the Afghans we also actually passed legislation um, called the Allies Act that made it easier. We eliminated, literally in law, eliminated some of the hurdles to get people over here. And then the, then the final piece is, is, is on media, um, yeah. is going and, and taking the case to yeah. millions of Americans yeah. of saying why this matters, what screwed up and what needs to be done. Right. And, and so, you know, the combination of those things, uh, we've gotten a lot of people out, but we have a long way to go. You know, and to that point, the State Department, um, a lot of the folks I talked to just, I got a text before we came out here uh, uh, of someone who says, you know, not as the State Department, not helping, they're putting up roadblocks. Yeah. Um, can you speak to that? You know, is it is it a manpower thing? Is it an is it a attitude thing? Is it is it a, is there, there are valid reasons? Just we want to make sure we vet people properly. Yeah. Um, I think it's um, I think it's twofold. One, there's been some decisions made at the top. Mm. Uh, unclear to me whether it was um, you know with the Secretary of State or over at the White House. Um, but there was decisions made at the top that they were going to that one that they were going to get out on a timeline, right. regardless of leaving Americans behind and regardless of leaving our allies behind. And with that came all of our capability that we just or right. left all of our capability. Um, but that they were going to focus on American citizens first, 
Then they were going to focus on green card holders and um, uh, legal permanent residents, and then uh, kind of a lesser extent, SIVs and interpreters. But the ones as we, you know, the ones we promised. We have so many others <laughs> yeah, yeah, um, yeah. that are incredibly vo- female yeah. judges, yes. journalists, yeah. artists. Um, you know, folks who worked with us very closely in the Afghan military, the Taliban, talk- all of which are hunting you know, them down as we speak. And they don't fit into kind of, this is to get to your point, yeah. in the State Department bureaucracy, they don't fit. They don't check every box. In every category. Yeah. Yeah. And the culture there is very process-oriented. Right. So, uh, you know, if you look at that in contrast to Vietnam... Uh, and the evacuation of the South Vietnamese, when then President Ford said to the bureaucracy, we're gonna do this, went to Congress to eliminate a lot of the hurdles and made it you know, a whole of government top-down priority and effort, we haven't had that. Yeah. And so the bureaucracy is just kind of crept in. And can you talk just shortly about why it's so important to get the commandos out. I just watched your panel over here. Yeah. And a lot of the talk was about these kind of special forces, Afghan commandos, and their value to us on a national security level. Well, these are the ones that fought to the very end. Yeah. They were the most elite, and they worked most closely with us. And frankly, they took the fight of the Taliban the hardest. Mm. Uh, incredibly well-trained, uh, and, and the Taliban are settling scores. Um, but from just aside from the humanity of it and the moral imperative, they have a lot of knowledge right. that we don't want falling into their hands of right. how we do our intelligence operations, how we do our counterterrorism operations. Uh, and uh, it's already happening. Some of them are, are, are giving up or uh, they're, they're being tortured and forced to give up this information under duress. So it's not just a moral imperative, it's a national security imperative that we get these people out and get them out of the terrorist hands. Are some of them flipping to the Taliban because they know if I don't, I'll be killed? You know, it's, it's yeah, some of them are, yeah. and, and I don't make judgment. When the, yeah. the Taliban, if they can't get at you, they start killing members of your family. Right. Uh, and even some that we've gotten out successfully here, they're still going after the family. I mean, I know one uh, that we got out and then they kidnapped his nephew and said, his life or yours if you don't come back. I mean, what do you do with that? Yeah. Right? Uh, so it's just a horrific situation you know, all around. And the most frustrating thing is we put ourselves, it's yeah. a self-inflicted. Yes. We put ourselves in this situation. So we're here though, right? Yep. And um, the, you know, the question is, so. What do we do? And, and, and to, to, you know, t- to be fair, there's a lot of Democrats as well as Republicans in the House and Senate helping with these evacs, helping with these SIV holders, helping get people out. Um, but we don't have a government policy to, to take some of this weight off these private organizations no. who, you know, who, who I see on these calls, you know, it's three months in. They're yeah. exhausted. Yeah. They haven't had a full night's sleep since August 31st. That's right. There's still hundreds of thousands of people that the Taliban want to take out. Yeah. So that that I don't you know that that's gonna wear. It's gonna at yeah. some point people are just gonna like collapse. So what do we? What can we do? <laughs> what should we do? Um, if anything. <laughs> yeah. Right. I mean, uh, look, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna sugarcoat that there's yeah. some magic solution. Yeah. Uh, you know, it 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 takes. Uh, this is why you know. Elections matter, yeah. and who we elect as president and commander-in-chief matter. Yeah. Uh, I guarantee you Ronald Reagan wouldn't have handled it this way. Uh, Ford yeah. uh, didn't handle it this way. He put a, a, a whole-of-government task force together and said, make this a priority. And short of Biden doing that, uh, we're going to have to get it done on our own, as exhausted as we are. <sighs> a lot of people would say, well, you know, are we realistically going to get hundreds of thousands out? No, I don't think we are. Yeah. Um, And that's going to be a painful reckoning, and I'm not sure how we're going to come to that. Uh, But what I do think is going to happen over there uh, is the resistance to the Taliban is going to continue to grow. Mm. uh, And that you are going to see these groups, you know, have to fight for themselves. Uh, And many of us predicted that, um, that if we just yank everybody out and just wish the problem away, the country is going to devolve into a civil war. Uh, because the Taliban brutality that they haven't changed. No. Biden administration yeah. tried to convince us that, that we can work with the good terrorists against the really bad terrorists, you know, kind of a Taliban against ISIS. Not true. Uh, but 
There is a natural resistance to their authoritarian regime. We did have a whole generation of Afghans who tasted freedom and yeah. want a better life and are going, I think, going to take the fight to them uh, back to the Taliban. And the question is, will we support them right. as a government? Because if we don't, Al-Qaeda, ISIS, and others fully intend to hit us again. And I don't want to wait until we have another attack on the homeland before we take action. So what can just the regular citizen do? Can they donate to some of these charities? Yeah, can they write a letter to the editor? I mean, can they send a note to, you know, to you of support? What, yeah. what can, because people yeah, feel sure, so, they feel, sure. they, they feel, well, <laughs> what, you know. We still feel so look, helpless. It's, yeah. It's, yeah. I know these groups are, are yeah. going through tens of thousands of dollars a day to keep yeah. some of these people safe. Okay. So every donation matters. This is completely privately funded. Um, and that's in the evacuation piece, and that matters. We also have the resettlement piece here, of the ones that we've got out. Uh, and, and there's a number of groups that are, that are focused on that. Look, um, I'm working on legislation. Some of these highly trained special forces, pilots, to, for a pathway into the U.S. military. Well, I want to keep utilizing yeah. their skills, and they want to join. And if we have to go back to deal with that mess, uh, they will be valuable. Um, but, you know, I, I hate to say this, too, but elections matter. Yeah. And, um, you know, vote and be very clear-eyed on, on who you're voting for. Uh, and we'll have elections again in just 11 months. Did you ever think when you were... And that's not a partisan. I don't want that, you yeah. know, there's... I have worked with dozens of Democrats on this effort. They were almost all veterans. Yes. Uh, and this is why I'm passionate. You know, I, you and I were talking, we've gone from, in the 1970s, 80% of the Congress were vets. Yeah. Today it's sitting at 16%. Yeah. Record low in our yeah. nation's history. Uh, and that's why we need more veterans in office both sides of the aisle. And we've talked about doing yep. that. You know, yep. I've said if, if you support the EVACs and you're a Democrat and you're running for office, I'm going to come sing a song for you. And last awesome. night I spent uh, some time with you and your uh, fellow Congress colleagues, some Democrats, some veterans, and I really appreciated the tone, the dynamic between you, because for you guys who've, who've, who've seen what we few can imagine, yeah. um, the respect, the understanding that your whole persona is not wrapped up in politics and yeah. an election, allows you to have conversations that you can disagree um, but respect each other and move the ball, move that's, the football right. forward. Yeah. So I'm with you. The more veterans we can get in. So if you're a veteran, you know who to Run. call. <laughs> um, Run. Run for office. And that's yeah. not just in yeah. Congress. That's yeah. in county commissions. Yes. It's in yes. state legislatures. It's at every level. Because yes. as you said, it's not that we agree on or disagree on every issue. It's the ethos. Yes. Right. If we were willing to die for that flag, then we'd be yes. willing to get in a room, roll up our sleeves, find common ground, and yes. and, and move, move the ball forward. Because you... You don't accomplish the mission in combat, really bad things happen. Well, we need to bring that mentality yes. know, back to uh, governing this country. So, I think Afghanistan um, overrides our typical p political arguments, sure. you know, taxes, even, even border security. Because, you know, we didn't promise those people coming across the border that we would take care of them and save their lives. Yeah. We did promise those people in Afghanistan. Well, look, I mean, from my perspective, the number one job of the federal government is to keep us safe. Yeah. The number one job of the commander in chief is to keep us safe. Uh, and when our adversaries around the world, uh, Iran, the Russians, uh, China, North Korea, see us abandoning an ally that has been fighting with us for 20 years, for two decades, yeah. it has huge implications and it is no coincidence that we're seeing china on the march we're seeing russians uh the russians mass on ukraine's border we're seeing iran sprint towards a nuclear weapon which will cause a nuclear arms race in the middle east uh, i mean um uh, th this has real uh this is we're on a horrible slippery slope and has real implications so uh, you're right it matters did you ever think we can disagree on like the role of labor unions yes. or or yes. tweaking tax policy, right? Yes. But at the end of the day, you know, if America doesn't lead around the world, who does? Did you ever think when you were kind of piloting your tank battalion and you were standing at the tank and telling this guy go there, this guy go yeah. there, that one day you'd be sitting at the Reagan Library as a congressman from Florida, knee deep in all of these you know, geopolitical national issues? 
Never in a million years, man. <laughs> Never in a million years. What does your and, mom think about and it? Only, <laughs> only in this uh, country, be, yeah. you know, being in politics was never in the cards, yeah. right? I, yeah. I wanted to serve my country, but, uh, and and then, uh, you know, built a business that I'm very proud of and just saw, though, that um, there were very little people uh, in Congress in Washington with dirt and blood and sweat and tears under yeah. their fingernails. And when we're making these kind of go to war, don't go to war, you know, uh, how do we withdraw from a 20 year, when we're making these kind of decisions, when we're sending the next generation of, uh, of, of service members abroad, the ones that are out there right now, um, then, you know, there are plenty of things I hate about politics, but their lives are worth it. And they're why, they're, they're why I'm here. Well, thank you for your clarity. Thank you for your courage. Um, and thank you for your friendship. And thank yes, you for sir. thanks for being a Amen. hero. <laughs> Listen, <laughs> hey, who's who's who are your heroes? Who you are know, your heroes? I'll tell you, this guy right here, Staff Sergeant Matt Pacino, uh, one of my Green Berets that that, that I lost. Mm. Uh, Staff Sergeant Brian Woods, uh, who had premonitions of his own death, mm. uh, so strong that he wrote dozens of letters to his kids and his wife and his teammates. But yet, when he died, he was leading the charge. Oh. He wasn't hiding in the back. Uh, you know, I can go on down the list. Uh, they're my heroes. Uh, they don't get to enjoy a beautiful evening uh, like this. And, you know, every day that I, before I go into the Capitol and I put this on, I look in the mirror and tell myself to be worthy. Ugh. Like, be worthy. And that's my call to action to everyone. You know, uh, how we conduct ourselves, how we behave as Americans, how we engage with each other. We can vehemently disagree on all kinds of things the end of the day we're all americans and we should behave in a way that's worthy of their sacrifice may we all be worthy all right brother thanks buddy yeah thanks thank you <laughs>